Hymn number four, How Great Thou Art. announcements that I have is next Sunday will be our first Sunday fellowship so please plan on that Jonathan's class we will have at five o'clock today also tonight we'll have fifth Sunday singing tonight at six following Jonathan's class if you have not signed up on the list you might be volunteered so please find your place there <laughs> you will be volunteered if you do not sign up Jonathan's even signed up right you be volunteered. <laughs> okay, some of you guys have been asking questions about that board out in the back. That board is our missions conference board. We put out envelopes on that board that you can put some money in and, and put it in there. That's what we use to fund the missions conference that we will have coming up at the beginning of April. Um, we use it to board our missionaries coming to help pay for some other things, expenses going on with that. So far, we have collected $348 towards the board. So 
We still have a little bit to go, but we're on the right track. I would encourage you to be in prayer for the missions conference. Although it's a big blessing to be able to put it on, there's a lot of moving parts to it, and there's a lot of hands at play that work on that. So please be in prayer for that. As Tamara mentioned tonight, is our first Sunday singspiration and testimony. I think there's about four, maybe five names on the list. So you, I'll be standing at the front door of the church. And uh, if you don't volunteer, you don't go home. So I'll get uh, Preacher and Miss Judy to help me to keep you locked in. So hymn number 354. Hymn number 354. Stand hymn number 447, God will take care of you. This will be our offering to him.
Tori, thank you for being in your place. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Brother Paul, would you ask to offer Tori? Number 251, hymn number 251.
turning, if you will, to Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. We are still looking at our series that we started the 1st of January, and uh, we have several more messages to go, tracing the life of Abraham <clears throat> the lesson before us is one message you, or one passage you may not be all that familiar with. As a matter of fact, not uh, many messages probably have ever been preached that you've heard of from, from, from these verses. But we will try to be diligent in uh, telling you what the truth is behind this narrative and what a passage it is. I don't know why we don't speak on it more often and um, but we'll try to we'll try to fill in the blanks for you. It's so good to see you this morning, and uh, I am absolutely in awe to be here to stand in front of you and to open up God's precious word. I think before we do anything else, we need to just pause just a moment, get our minds ready to hear the message. It's one thing just to hear it, but it's another thing to listen. And I pray that you have come ready to listen to the Word of God. Not necessarily me. I'm just a vessel in which God can use. But I trust that you'll listen to the words of the Lord and how it will challenge your heart. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we come into this building thanking you for the bounty and your blessings this last week. And Lord, we realize that there are people here that have come from various backgrounds spiritually. There could be some that's avid Bible readers and there could be those that study diligently and seek your face. 
while there may be some in this room, Lord, that just simply don't spend that much time with you. And Father, I, don't, I know that you desire a special relationship for all of us. But wherever we are in our walk with you, I would pray for just a few moments that today we could carve out a little bit of time and learn something that perhaps we've overlooked and we've missed. It's amazing when we get into the Word of God to see some things that is applicable to our own lives. And Father, many have the mistaken idea that this is just an old book and what difference does it make? Well, it makes a whole lot of difference when we apply the principles that's taught. Lord, I know there are some in here that are hurting physically. And Lord, there could be a spiritual pain that many of us may not ever see. I pray, Father, that you will open up our hearts and bear it. And Lord, I pray that whatever direction you want us to take this morning, it will be you and not me. And Father, we've tried to be diligent. We've tried to see the things and say the things and write down what is appropriate. But Father, I pray that I will not take any way, anything away from who you are. Lord, I pray this morning that you would get all the glory. In Christ's name I pray, amen. I found a quote this week by a man by the name of Henry Moore. Henry Moore said this, The secret of life is to have a task, something you can do your entire life, something you can bring everything to, every minute of the day for your whole life. And the most important thing is, it must be something you cannot possibly do. Think about that. It cannot be something you can possibly do, meaning this. Sometimes our goals are, are, are set way too low. And often that we, we, we may never, we, we, we set these goals, we do these, but never we challenge ourselves to reach beyond ourselves. And we've challenged the church this year is to not just be content, is to fight the good fight of faith, push ourselves. When, when, those, when those episodes come that, uh, that your body is tired and the devil whispers to you, you're no account. You don't mean nothing. You don't need to go to church. You're too tired. You have other things to do. When we fight the good fight of faith, meaning this, that we're going to persevere through, we're going to do those things, even when our flesh does not want to. Now, can I tell you something this morning? Every one of us have been at an episode just like that. Your flesh says, don't go. Your flesh says, don't do it. And finally, your spiritual side overrides that and says, yes, you have to do this. You need to do this because it'll be better for you in the long run. So stretch yourself. Do something that you don't think you can possibly do. And that statement is so important for this reason only. Because you're about to see something today, right now in this room, in this story. Somebody didn't think they could do something that they possibly could do. Now, everybody with me so far? Stretch yourself. Abraham come upon a situation that on paper was impossible. There was no way that he could do this. Absolutely, there was absolutely no way that he could uh, go through what he was fixing to go through. Now, I will tell you this. Many of us look at Abraham in the Bible as a great man of faith, and certainly he developed into that. But it took him a while to get to that point. So let me show you this. You may not be where you want to be in life, but can I tell you this? You can get there, spiritually speaking. Now, wait a minute. You can get there if you continue doing those things that you need to do. So let me invite you to do something. Now, I'm going to introduce this passage a little bit different. Uh, go ahead and get that verse up there, if you will, Brother Chris. Genesis chapter 14, verse number 1. Now, I want you to look in your Bibles right quick. Everybody look at, at verse 1. I want, I want to show you something. Now, with these, with these verses, I would just tell you this. There are a lot of hard words in these verses. 
So let me just challenge you this. So I'm giving you the text verses. Scan down, if you will, to go ahead in verse number two, Brother Chris. And all of these words and all of these things, I'm just going to tell you from the outset. You can pronounce them probably better than I can. So I don't want to embarrass myself in trying to do that. All right? So Genesis chapter 14, 1 through 4. Can I just sort of kind of tell you what's going on here? Amen? Amen. You might as well say that because I'm going to do it anyway. Now, these are important, and the words are important. I just cannot pronounce them to do it due diligence. So let me just show you what's going on. In these uh, verses, you see four kings going against five kings. So far, so good. Matt, you got this. You see four kings going against five kings. Four powers from the east formed a coalition headed up by one of these kings, all right? So you've got four kings going against five kings. Now they all come to an area where Abraham grew up. Are you with me so far? They all went through the land, defeating the forces of these five uh, city-states around the area of the Sea of Galilee. Now listen to this. They also defeated the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. After these invaders conquered these five city-states, the kings who won these battles placed these other kings under tribute. So, here's what we know so far. You've got four kings defeating five kings. And they come through and they did everything imaginable you could do to a nation. They plundered, they killed, they did everything to to make these five kings miserable. Now, this four-king coalition was very, very powerful. And nobody in the... Come on. Everybody watch. Nobody in the right mind will go against these four kings. They had too much power. They had too much might. So these other five kings realized that. But let me show you something. In the, after, thir- after 12 years, in the 13th year, these five kings, look at this, these five kings got fed up with what these four kings was doing to them, right? Okay, now, so they eventually rebelled. So the five kings said something like this, why are we sitting taking everything that these guys are doing to us? Let's all, watch this, let's all pull our resources and let's do this. And let's go against this mighty four king coalition. I think, they said, if we just pull our resources, we can win the battle. Now, in doing so, all of this, these five kings rebelled. And guess what happened? Well, let me tell you what happened. You don't have time to guess. So, the five kings says, we're tired of being ruled by the four kings, right? So here's what they did. We're going to go against, and we're going to pull our resources, and we're going to attack them, and we're going to win. We're going to have such a mighty battle here, and we're going to defeat them. We're going to chop them into pieces, and we're tired of paying taxes. We're tired of doing all the things they're making us do. So here we go. They get into the battle, and guess what? They got it a second time. Listen, these four kings... Wiped these five kings out one more time. They went through. They started killing them one more time. They started getting them just exactly what happened the first time. Now, why is all of that important? It's because of this. When when they went through and did this the second time, Abraham's nephew Lot was captured. Are you with me? When Abraham heard what had happened, he had an army, listen to this, he had an army of 318 men. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking that's, it may be in that day and time, that's not too bad. So here's what Abraham did. Now listen to me, because you got to get this. Abraham was a man that was, we, 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 look at, we look at scripture, he was a great man of faith, but also... Abraham, here's a side that we never see. Abraham was a great warrior. Listen to me. He trained 318 men to know how to fight. 
Oh, preacher, we never did think about that before. Listen to me. He trained his servants how to fight. Now, why would he do this? Well, he knew this. It's because eventually he knew he would have to fight. Some of you aren't awake yet. You are still, you're just barely coming in. Your, your mindset's not with me. So let me give you one more time. Abraham's nephew was captured. Prior to his capture, are you with me? Amen. Give me a hearty amen. amen. Prior to his capture, Abraham trained his men. And he said this, guys, there's going to come a day when potentially we're going to have to fight. And when, when we're going to have to fight, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give it everything we have. Now, what, what, what were you getting at, preacher? I'm glad you asked. Watch this. The five kings could not defeat the four kings. Why? It's because they were so powerful. They were so mighty. And there was no way the five was going to defeat the four. How do we know this? It's because twice they got plundered. Twice they got pillaged. And twice they were wiped out. In the process of all of this, Lot was captured. Abraham had heard this. But Abraham, listen to this. Abraham had already trained his servants to fight. Now here's what I'm going to tell you. In our day and time, our mentality would be something like this. Last week we told you that Abraham and Lot had already kind of had some issues. Now, in our way of thinking, here's what, we, here's what Abraham could have thought. Well, he went down there cl- close to Sodom, and maybe he's going to get exactly what he deserves. Now, wait a minute. That's the way, come on with me, that's the way you and I would think. He, he did all of these squirrely things, so now he's going to get what he deserves. But now, wait a minute. There was something about Abraham that I want you to see in verse number 14. Genesis 14, 14. And I want you to see this, what it says. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, talking about Lot, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318 And he pursued them unto Dan. Now, wait a minute. Again, here's some humor in the Bible. I know you're humorless this morning. I understand that. You guys are bored and you guys have other things you think you need to do. So let me give you some humor. Five nations could not defeat. Come on. Four. What makes you think Abraham's 318 men could beat them? Does that seem logical to you? It seems quite logical to me. And I'm reading this story and I'm thinking, on paper, Abraham, you just don't make sense. I don't understand how Abraham could train his own men and say something like this. Watch this. Guys, we're going to go against this mighty force. And let me give you a pep talk. You're outmanned. There's no way that they think that you're going to win. They have more resources, they've got more land, they've got more everything that we have, but we're going to go anyway. Now, I know what you're thinking. Yeah, but preacher, I know the, yeah, you know the outcome, but if you're standing there in those 318 men, they don't know the outcome yet. Here's what they think. We're going to go, and this is a suicide mission. Are you following me? There is no way on paper that this thing's going to work. Abraham trained these men, his own men, his own servants. He recruited these men. So obviously, Abraham feels like that these guys are pretty salty. Amen. These guys can handle themselves into battle. So all of this is going on, and, 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 and I'm thinking all, how, how all of this is going to play out. But Abraham stepped into the gap. And I thought this was interesting. During this particular time period that we're looking at in our Bible, one Roman historian said these words. Mercy is the disease of the soul and an ultimate sign of weakness. So during that time, there was no mercy. 
If you wanted to kill somebody, guess what you got to do? Come on with me. You just kill them. If you wanted what somebody had and you thought you were man enough to do it, guess what you could do? You could go ahead and do whatever you wanted to do with them, right? All right. Are you following me? So let me give you number one. There are five qualities that people of faith should have when trouble comes. Five qualities that people of faith should have when trouble comes. Number one is the first is sympathy. Number one, the first cause is sympathy. It's on your screen. This is what Abraham had to his nephew Lot. In other words, Abraham would not necessarily have to get involved, but he got involved. If Abraham choose, chose to have the mentality of others back then, Lot would not have had a chance. And I want to show you something, and I just want to give you this from the outset. All through history of time, it has been the Christians, followers of Christ, who responded in times of need. It has been followers of Christ that's made the difference. Let me ask you this. Are you still awake? I want you to answer this in your mind. You don't have to answer it out loud, but in your mind. How many atheist hospitals do you know? How many atheist centers of compassion do you know? I can tell you, you don't go t too far where you know how many Christian hospitals there are. What, what, what my point is, it's been the Christians all through time that has stepped up. Stepped up in time of difficulty. Stepped up when somebody's hurting. It's been churches in our community that has stepped up when there's been a time of need, when there's been a death, or when there's been a disaster. Who brings the food to the... Fa Come on. Who brings the food to the grieving families? You think it's the atheists and those people that don't care? Oh, they might have a, a, they might have a card. They might do something on the, on the fringe. But I'm telling you, those that truly make a difference have been those followers of Christ Jesus. Amen. And so here's Abraham training his 318 men to go into this suicide mission. Mission. They had no chance of winning on paper. There's no way they could, they could do this. So, number two, the second quality of uh, people of faith should have is that of bravery. Number two is bravery. Now, we began to see a whole new side of Abraham. Abraham took his servants and three allies, and went after these attackers. It's almost unbelievable if it wasn't in your Bible. Genesis chapter 14, verse 15. Notice this. Genesis chapter 14, verse number 15. The Bible says, And he divided himself against them, and he and his servants, those 318 by night. Look at this. Now, I want to tell you, I know it's just a simple statement, but it's unbelievable. And smote them. Well, that's pretty good. But now what happens next? And pursued them. Now, that's incredible. Look at verse 16. And he brought back. Look at this word that just stands out. He brought back all the goods. And also brought again his brother Lot, or his nephew, and his goods. And the women also. And the people. So here's what you're telling me, preacher. You're telling me that five nations could not defeat four nations. They got it twice. You remember this? And so now you're telling me that Abraham trained 318 brave Medal of Winter Honors. And they went after these, these nations that were superior and not only did they win, the Bible says they got all of the goods. Are, are you following this? I know some of you just kind of clicking in now. You're just kind of sort of, you're just sort of kind of waking up from your Sunday slumber, and I get all that. But I'm telling you, 300 against an innumerable amount of people. And not only an innumerable amount of people, but amount of people that were tough. Amount of people that did not care about uh, chopping your head off. A, a group of mercenaries that thrived on battle. They thrived on killing. 
They thrived on getting what you had and taking for themselves. Now, I know some of you are not getting this. I'm going to put the puzzle together. Stay with me. I'm just telling you, this is a side of Abraham that we do not see. This is a man of war. How do I know this? Because he trained those men. Now, how did he train them? Well, he went out on the field. He went out and showed them. Guys, watch this. When we get into this situation, here's how we're going to react. If, if they, now watch. If they come this way, we're going to go this way. If they do this, we're going to do that. So far, it is absolutely unbelievable. There is no way that this has a way of working. Abraham had a small army. But here's what I like. Not only did he have a small army, but they were ready to defend And they were ready to fight. Can I say this? Could that be said about you spiritually speaking? But I want to stop right here just a moment. And I want to pull back. And I want you to stay with me. And I want you to give me just some brief eye contact before you go back to sleep. Abraham, by and large, was a man of peace. He had trained his men in the art of warfare. Abraham knew he couldn't leave his nephew to these evil nations. So he prepared himself and his men. Abraham was willing to put his life on the line. And when the situation called for it, he was ready to fight. Elgin Staples was a 19-year-old sailor who served on the USS Astoria. A New Orleans-class heavy cruiser. In the Second World War. One morning, one of the large guns exploded and threw him overboard. He had shrapnel in both legs and he was in shock. The only thing that kept his head above water was a life belt he was wearing at the time. When they hit the water, he was just conscious enough to trigger the button inflating that belt. The belt saved his life. Listen to this. It gets even stranger. Four hours later, a passing destroyer picked up this young sailor out of the sea and returned him to ship. Several hours after that, the captain of that ship decided to try to beach that ship since the damage was much worse than he originally thought. The attempt to beach the ship did not go according to plan and incredibly, listen to this, that young man found himself back in the ocean for a second time. He had never taken off that life belt that had saved his life. And it saved him once again. Hours later, he was rescued again by another ship, the USS Andrew Jackson. It gets squirrelier than that. Lying on his bunk in sick bay. This young man never let go of that inflatable belt that saved his life twice. He studied every inch of its service, surface, noting its sturdy construction. Someone had very carefully put that belt together. Time and time again in the hospital bed, he would examine that belt and marvel that such a device could save his life twice in the same day. The irony was that that belt had been made in his own hometown of Akron, Ohio, at the Firestone Tire and Rubber Company. After his hospitalization, he was given an extended leave to go home to see his family, and his own words, he described what happened next. He writes, When I finally took my 30-day leave, I went home to my family in Ohio, After an emotional welcome, I sat with my mother in our kitchen telling her about my recent ordeal and hearing what had happened at home since I had been away. My mother informed me that, to do her part, she had gotten a wartime job at a Firestone plant. Surprised, he says, I jumped up And grabbing my life belt from my duffel bag, I put it on a table in front of her. 
Take a look at that, Mom. It was made right here in Akron at your plant. She leaned forward and, taking the rubber belt in her hands, she read the label. She had just heard this story and knew that in the darkness of that terrible night, it was that one piece of rubber that saved my life. Then she looked up at me. Her mouth and eyes were open wide with surprise. Son, I am an inspector at Firestone. Your belt has my inspection number on it. We stared at each other, too stunned to speak. When I stood up and walked around the table and pulled her up from her chair, we held each other in tight embrace. My mother was not a distraught uh, a, a woman with much emotions, but that significance of this amazing coincidence, her reserve let loose. We hugged each other for a long time, feeling the bond between us. Listen to this. He writes, My mother had put her arms halfway around the world to save my life. What's that got to do with anything? Well, my friend, God makes all things possible. In this story, Abraham had no business of winning against that incredible odds. And there in our story, the Bible says, Abraham smote them and pursued after them. Listen to this. Not only did he defeat these nations, but he chased them. Come on with me. He chased them. At any moment, come on, at any moment, these four nations could watch they could have turned around at these 318 men and says, Why are we running? Shouldn't we be able to win? That's not what happened. The Bible says he smote them and kept on and on. Let me challenge you with a, this. Christians... The devil is just exactly like those nations. They're not going to quit until you decide, I have God on my side. And I am tired of all he is doing in my life. I am sick of him defeating me. Come on. Time after time after time. I have had enough. With your limited resources, it's time for the church of the living God to do an about face and get on with our pursuit and don't get weary in well-doing. Can I tell you, the church of the living God is, should be on the offensive every single day we live and quit letting the voices of unreason and the voices of our world to tell us that we are nobody, we can't do it. I'm going to tell you, as long as God is on the throne, all things are possible. Amen. This story is absolutely spellbounding. Abraham was a man with a sense of presence. Can I just give you this? He chased this army. Now, wait a minute. 318 men against an overwhelming force. Abraham chased this massive army 150 miles. It, listen, it's one thing is to go in this suicide mission and to fight. But it's another thing to keep going and going and going, and going. Somebody give the Lord an amen. amen. 150 miles, and he did not quit. Amazing. Amazing. Let me ask you this question that begs to be asked. What does it take for you to quit? Maybe the odds aren't in your favor, you think. 
Maybe this morning you have come into this room and you have thought, Preacher, you just don't understand. Maybe I don't understand, but I'm just going to tell you this. I have a whole lot more confidence in God than I do of anything else. And I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what's in your home. I don't know what's in your situation. I don't know what's in your zip code. But I can tell you this. If you are missing a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, my friend, you're missing the greatest asset that the world has ever seen and could know. And that is our relationship with Christ and Christ alone. Abraham, a man of war, took action. (laughs) It's almost unbelievable. The third quality we must have is capability. The third quality we must have is capability. Maybe you're called for a larger role than what you're engaged in now. Success might not come instantly, and it may take years. I love what Charles Spurgeon wrote. Charles Spurgeon wrote these words. By perseverance, the snail reached the ark. What does that mean? He just kept on and on and on. Meaning you take stands on issues that might not come easily. And can I tell you, you might not think that what you're going through will ever have an end. Abraham, a man who responded with sympathy, bravery, and capability. Capability means this, the power and ability to do something. The power and ability to do something. If you are a saved individual in this room, God has given you the ability to do something. Winston Churchill delivered his most famous speech in 1941, two years at his alma mater, the Harlow School in Great Britain. At that time, all of Europe felt the devastating effects of World War II. Churchill said his nation entered the war unprepared, but then worked to become prepared. Churchill gave a little speech to the students of that school and also to the entire nation. And he said and concluded his remarks like this. Never, never give in. Never give in. Never, 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 never in nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force. Never never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. My friend, I want to tell you, our churches and our nation have absolutely capitulated to the devil and his crowd. We have silenced our voices on issues that need to be uh, broadcast from pulpits today. If you are listening on Facebook, our pulpits of the land have grown too silent and too stale. It's time for us to lift up the banner of Almighty God. And thus saith the Lord is what it says. And if the devil and his crowd doesn't like it, they just can't like it. Because we will not give in. We will never, never, never surrender to that. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand in the house of God. Never give in. The fourth quality is integrity. The fourth quality is integrity. When Abraham returned from his unlikely victory, the king of Sodom told Abraham some interesting words. And I want you to see this before we close. Genesis chapter 14, verse 22. I want you to see these interesting words. After the battle, watch this. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God and possessor of heaven and earth, That I will not, circle circle that, I will not take from a thread even to thy shoe latchet, that I will not take anything that is thine. Talking about the king of Sodom. Lest thou should say, I have made Abraham rich. Now, save only, now watch, which the young men have eaten and the portion of the men that went with me and, and let them take their portion. Here's what he says. Mr. King of Sodom, I understand, watch, that you want to enrich me. 
And I understand because we had this, come on with me, we had this tremendous victory. You want to give me all of these things. Watch this. You know what Abraham says? If I take those things, then the world would say, I went to battle just because of the riches. And here's what he said. I will not rob God of his glory. It was God who wrought the victory and not me. And I am not going to take anything from your hand to take away from the glory of God. The question for you. How many times? Come on. How many times do we feel like, boy, we're doing God a favor. He is so lucky to have me. Boy, I want to tell you what. God is just lucky that I can, that, that, that he has me in his kingdom. Boy, look how great I am. You know what made Abraham great? It's because he figured this out. God will get the glory. I'm not going to step on him. I'm not going to try to get in his way. Because here's what I figured out. God doesn't need me. He can use anybody he chooses to. I'm just fortunate to be in his army. That's integrity. That's what made Abraham special. The fifth quality is the word humility. The fifth quality is the word humility. Now, there's various opinions on all of this that I'm fixing to read to you, and I'm not going to get into all of that because it'll take too long. You, if you want something long and, 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 and bloviating, go to Jonathan's class. He can sure do that. <laughs> so I'm not going to do all of that. I'll just, I'll just read you the verse and go on. There's so much into this, but I do want to show you as we close. Genesis chapter 14, verse number 18. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was a priest of the Most High God. Now watch this. And he blessed him and says, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. This gets interesting here. And blessed to be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. Now watch this. He, God delivered the enemies. Don't forget that. And he gave him... Ties of, oh, you're going to get into that. No, here's what I'm going to tell you. Here's what I want you to know. The name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. This was the only man. Listen to me. This was the only man Abraham recognized as his superior because Abraham paid him a tithe. The ancients considered tithing as an act of worship and as an act of submission. Abraham knew God gave him the victory Instead of pride, Abraham had true humility. I will tell you this. What sets great men apart today is those men who display the act of humbleness. There's a lot of divas in our pulpits today. Come on with me. There's a lot of people in our pulpits today that believe that everybody should serve them. And, and can I tell you a little secret? If every pulpit in the land just got back to preaching the gospel, we would be so far better. Amen. Instead of making ourselves seem so superior. Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek and saying, Here, I am humbling myself to you. Humble. I'll finish with this story. Robert Morgan wrote about President William McKinley. William McKinley was a dedicated Christian. And when McKinley became president, he maintained his Christian testimony. One Sunday, a fierce political opponent attended McKinley's church. Listen to this. He attended McKinley's church to spy on him during the worship service, expecting to find some trace of hypocrisy or showmanship. The man later wrote these words. I watched the president. I watched his face while he sang. 
I gave close attention to his countenance and attitude during the opening service and his interest in the earnest words which were spoken before the Lord's Supper was administered. And after a while, I even saw the president get up from his place, go and kneel down at the altar, humbly with the rest, and reverently take the Lord's Supper. And when he arose, he quietly wiped away traces of emotion from his eyes, his cold countenance and attitude showing the deepest religious emotion. I confess to you that I felt a great change coming over myself. And I said to myself, A country which has a man like that at the head of its affairs is not so badly after all. Can I tell you? We need those humble servants of God. The lesson that you heard this morning is just absolutely incredible. I came impacted with this and... I was looking at it, and I thought to myself, it just is an incredible story. Not too many times you've heard this preach from many pulpits. But the bottom line is this. Abraham was willing to give God the glory. And my last statement to you is, are you willing to give him the glory? Father, thank you for the opportunity we've had. Lord, it's a story that needs to be told. It's a story of your incredible strength and your incredible desire to bless human men when we put you first. Lord, I do not know what the spiritual condition of anybody's heart is this morning, but I do know this. Anytime we meet in a gathering like this, there are those that need you. There are those that have been wayward. There are those in their thought life and in their personal life has not just been right with you. And Father, I'm just amazed. Abraham, he did not quit. Even though he defeated this army, he chased them still further and further. Lord, I pray as our body gets tired and as we feel like that we just want to give up, I pray, Father, that we will still go further and further and further. Today, in this service, I don't know if everybody here knows Christ Jesus as their personal Savior. Oh, but Lord, I pray that if there's one here that does not know the Lord, today would be that day. Maybe there's somebody here in this service, Lord, that has just been struggling, struggling to keep a Christian testimony, to keep their emotions in check, to do the things that would be pleasing unto the Lord all day long. Lord, I don't know, but I would just ask that you would have perfect reign in this service. Father, if there's a heart that needs to be touched, I pray that it will be touched. If there's a decision that needs to be made, I pray that it will be made. I ask that you stand with me all over this audience. If God so called you to make this decision, I pray that you would do this.